And everybody said, yeah. Father, we thank you for the workers' meeting tonight. We pray, Lord, you enlighten us in your word. And we pray your word will bear fruit in every life, every worker, every minister, in Jesus' name. Yeah. We pray, Lord, that the trumpet, when it sounds, will find us ready will not be left behind but of the raptured saints of God will go with them in Jesus mighty name we pray a good good amen God bless you you can be seated tonight we're looking at 1st Corinthians chapter 15 verses 51 and 52 behold i show you a mystery we shall not all sleep but we shall all be changed then in verse 52 it says in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump for the trumpet shall sound and the dead shall be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed in the middle of that verse it says the trumpet shall sound in the mind of paul the apostle he understood the use of the trumpet in israel from the time of the wilderness journey the trumpet sounded at the time of Gideon, as he rallied the people to battle against the Midianites, and those 300 committed people followed him, the trumpet sounded. In the temple, as they came for their worship, Paul the Apostle knew this very well, the use of the trumpet in the tabernacle worship. He comes to the New Testament, and he talks about the preachers and he said if the trumpet gives an uncertain sound who will prepare for war it was helping instructing revealing to the workers and the leaders that when we speak a voice like the trumpet should not give an uncertain sound we should speak courageously boldly and we should speak in such a way that everybody understand this is what is being said and now as we look at the orchestra if the trumpet gives a discordant sound that is the orchestra is playing you have the various instruments you also have the trumpeter if the trumpeter in his own part will give a discordant sound it will bring distraction and it will make the people not to have the real meaning and the enjoyment of the music that means then as the different parts are giving their sound the members witnessing the workers also doing so winning and the preachers preaching and the singers singing and the workers walking everyone must give a united sound that will not distract anyone that will point everyone to the very center of the message we're concerned the message tonight on the trumpet for our redemption the trumpet for the resurrection and the trumpet for the rapture because it's not only at the time of the rapture that the trumpet will sound the message tonight sounding the trumpet for redemption for resurrection and for the rapture sounding the trumpet for redemption resurrection and the rapture there are three things we're looking at in the message today number one the arousing trumpet that calls sinners to repentance number two the awakening trumpet that compels saved souls 
to be righteous. Number three, the archangel's trumpet to catch up, to take away the sins at the rapture. Number one, the allowed sin trumpet that calls sinners to repentance. We're looking at three things here. Number one is the alarming trumpet voice of the preacher. Number two, the arousing trumpet vocation of the prophet. Number three, the annoying trumpet vocab of the proclaimer. Number one is the alarming trumpet voice of the preacher. We're told in Isaiah chapter 58, reading from verse 1, it says, Cry aloud, spare not, lift up thy voice like a trumpet, and show my people their transgression, and the house of Jacob their sins. If we don't lift up our voice like a trumpet, the people, our audience will miss the trumpet of the final day. The first thing now is that we will realize that our voice is the trumpet. And it says, cry aloud, spare not. Ezekiel, I made you a watchman over the house of Israel, cry aloud. When I say to the sinner, thou shalt surely die, if you don't give him warning, if you don't lift up your voice like a trumpet, it will die in a sin, but his blood will I require out of you. And Jeremiah, don't say, I am a child. You will go to all the people I will send you to, and you will, you will pull down, you will throw down, you will uproot, and then you will plant and you will build. And Jesus Christ said to his own disciples, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. And and every one of us, as we go like that, will lift up our voice, an alarming trumpet voice of the preacher. It says, lift up your voice like a trumpet and show my people their transgression and the house of Jacob their sin. Look at verse 2. In verse 2 it says, yet they seek me daily and they delight to know my ways as a nation that did righteousness. They are superficially righteous. They are self-righteousness. They have the right Righteousness of the law which cannot save them. They do not have the righteousness of faith and the righteousness of Christ. And it says, tell them, tell them that religion is not enough. Tell them that the rituals are not enough. Tell them that all the things they are banking their salvation on, that those things cannot save, they must repent and turn around and come to Christ. They are seeking me daily. They will use that to say that how are we not in Christ already? Are we not Christians already? We are born Christians and our fathers and mothers who are Christians. Therefore, we are Christians. Tell them, they seek me daily. They delight to know my ways as a nation that did righteousness as if they did righteousness. It says, and forsook not the ordinance of their God. They ask of the ordinances of justice. They take the light in approach not to God. They go to church or they come to church. They go to camps or they come to camp. And they go to all these programs because they act like a nation seeking the Lord, approaching the Lord. Don't let that deceive you. Raise up your voice and tell them there might be people in our church here who have been coming for years and they have superficial religion. They have self-righteousness. They have external religion. But they're not saved. They don't have peace of mind. They don't have the joy of salvation. They don't have victory over sin. And they're falling and falling every time into sin. And yet they are called brother, they are called sister. Tell them and show them that the way of repentance and faith in Christ is the only way to get to heaven. Don't allow all their pretense and all their, I'm part of them. I can recite this. I can recite that. Don't allow that to hinder you lift up your voice like a trumpet. It tells us in chapter 27 of Isaiah, reading from verse 13, it says, it shall come to pass in that day that the 
great trumpet shall be blown the great trumpet shall be blown and they shall come which were ready to perish in the land of Assyria and the outcasts of the land of Egypt and shall worship the Lord they'll hear the preacher and they'll hear the trumpet voice of the preacher that will give no uncertain sound that will say what they ought to say properly they will come and they'll come to worship the Lord in the holy mount of Jerusalem Hosea chapter 8 I'm reading from verse 1 in Hosea chapter 8 verse 1 set the trumpet to thy mouth and he shall come as an eagle against the house of the Lord because they have transgressed my covenant and trespassed against my law that's why we lift up our voice that's why we speak with certainty and we speak with courage and we speak with bold and we speak with persuasion that the people who listen they will not have any shadow of doubt they will know we are talking to them and they will know that except they repent they will likewise perish look at verse 3 it tells us in verse 3 Israel has cast off the thing that is good the enemy shall pursue him that's why we talk to them that's why we call them that's why we tell them thou art the man thou art the woman you must repent because you knew the lord before the god of abraham the god of isaac and the god of jacob but now you have forsaken the good thing that the lord had given you that's why the enemy is pursuing look at verse 8 in verse 8 it says israel is swallowed up now shall they be among the gentiles as a vessel wherein there is no pleasure we tell them because you've gone back into sin because you are evil because you are backslider that's why god has no pleasure in you at present look at verse 12 in verse 12 i have written to him the great things of my law but they were counted as a strange thing the children of israel they came to the point where the word of god the law of god the utterance of god the proclamation of god became a strange thing unto them and then the prophet is now to go to them the proclaimer the preacher is now to lift up your voice like a trumpet don't allow them to all those excuses eh, we're still in the lord we don't serve any other idol we're still following the commandment of the lord the lord says no heaven evaluates them heaven judges them and heaven makes them to know that they are evil in the sight of the lord because they are counting the good pleasure of the lord and the good program of the lord and the good word of the lord as a strange thing so let there be number one the alarming trumpet voice of the preacher number two is the arousing a trumpet vocation of the prophet we're coming to second samuel chapter 12 here comes the prophet from verse 1 and the lord sent nathan unto david and he came unto him and said unto him there were two men in one city the one rich and the other poor and now david had committed a grievous sin a terrible sin is seeing that even people in the nation under him his subjects should not have committed he had involved another person too he involved joab that joab should put this man orias in the thickest part of the battle let him be killed so that he could cover up a sin that had taken place now for some months and, uh, and and David continued as a king, as a prince. He continued as a singer of Israel. He continued as the judge of Israel. He continued his normal administration, royal administration, normal work, as if nothing had happened. And somebody now has to come arouse his conscience. Somebody now has to come and pin him down and tell him you are 
the man although you're still officiating as a king and you're officiating you know, as the prince of the land yet you are not acceptable in the sight of the lord nobody had told him no, that's me nobody knew yes they knew all the people walking with him in the house the people is saying to go and call Beersheba. And the people is saying to, uh, to give wine unto Raya. They all knew. They knew the story. And Joab also knew. But none of them will talk until a prophet came. And this prophet had the arousing trumpet vocation of a trumpet look at verse 2 and then and the rich man had exceeding many flocks and herds and then in verse 3 it says but the poor man had nothing except one ewe lamb which he had bought and nourished up and it grew up together with him and he and with his children and de he did each of his own meat and drank of his own cup and lay in his bosom and was unto him as a daughter then in verse 4 we are told and there came a traveler unto the rich man and spared to take of his own flock and of his own herd to dress for the wayfaring man that was come unto him but took the poor man's lamb and dressed it for the man that was come to him verse 5 and David's anger was greatly kindled against the man now there are backsliders that still get angry at other people for they backsliding backsliders terrible sinners private sinners and they hide their sins in their bosom and when they hear that so and so has done this and so and so has done that they stand in the place in the position of a disciplinarian and they say that man must suffer for the sin he has committed that woman she must suffer for the sin she has committed get off the work don't do anything again. You're unholy. You're unrighteous. You cannot touch the sacred things of the Lord. Meanwhile, they themselves, like David, they have something they bottle in. They have something they hide. They have iniquity, transgression, and they have evil in their heart that they are covering up. And so, David now said in his anger, he said, somebody did that in my kingdom here. The man that has done this thing shall surely die. Look at verse 6. In verse 6, and he said, and he shall restore the lamb fourfold because he did this thing and because he had no pity. Now, sometimes when you listen to the vocabularies of some people, the way they descend on sin with a sledgehammer, and they say, that must be punished. You will think they were holy and sanctified. You will think they are pure and purified. You will think they have no guilt themselves. But look at verse 7. In verse 7, and Nathan said, to David now when you talk to somebody there are different ways you can talk to somebody you can glue your face on the ground you can be timid you can be fearful you can be wringing your hands together you can be sweating and the sweat will cover the palms of your hand because of the terrible fear that comes upon you. You may be wondering inside, who am I? This is the king. And if I'm not careful, he has the uh, authority. And he has the final say. He can cut short my life. You know, when you're thinking about yourself like that, he can pounce on me. 
he can persecute me he can send me to the prison he can send me to the dungeon he may separate me from my family when you're thinking of yourself you cannot raise up your voice like a trumpet but Nathan, looking at the face of David and pointing to him, he said, Thou art the man. Do you ever look at the faces of the people you're preaching to? Or are you looking down? Or are you looking at the ceiling as if your audience is in the ceiling? Or are you looking at the people? Can you look at your congregation? Do you use your hand at all? Or do you put your hand at the back all the time and then your feet shaking and you're looking down? You have to look at the people. The judge has to look at his audience has to look at the criminal the one that is passing the final sentence he has to look at them and no pranks they play no game they play should intimidate the man that has the trumpet vocation of the preacher and of the prophet so he said thou art the man thus says the Lord God of Israel I anointed thee king over Israel and delivered thee out of the hand of Saul. And then it goes on. Look at verse 13. In verse 13, it says, And David said unto Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. It is when the trumpet gives a direct sound, a persuasive sound, a loud sound, a piercing sound, a convicting sound that the man David or any other person will be able to say, I have sinned. And then he declared to him the mercy of God. They have to understand their sin. And they have to understand they need forgiveness and they need the grace of God to come out of that sin and live in victorious case in life that they cannot do by themselves. And then we'll pronounce to them the mercy and the grace of God. We're looking at number three here. Number three is the annoying trumpet vocab of the proclaimer annoying trumpet vocabulary the vocab of the proclaimer in first kings chapter 22 reading from verse 17 first kings chapter 22 reading from verse 17 and he said i saw all israel gathered upon the hills a sheep that have not a shepherd and the lord said these have no master the master is gone the master is slain the master is dead let them return every man to his house in peace look at uh, verse 18 in verse 18 and the king of israel said unto Jehoshaphat, did i not tell thee that he would prophesy no good concerning me but evil the man was annoyed i thought so i knew that's what he would say it's not it's not a social person it's not a compatible person it's not a, a compassionate person he doesn't you know when he see that there's a sin he calls it sin it does not use a kind of um, vocabulary that will gloss over their evil did i tell you he'll not speak any good concerning me look at verse 26 in verse 26 it says and the king of Israel said, Take Micaiah and carry him back unto Ammon, the governor of the city, and to Joash, the king's son. The next verse, 27, and say, Thus says the king, Put this fellow in prison, in the prison, and feed him with the bread of affliction and with the water of affliction until I come in peace verse 28 it says and Micaiah said if thou come if thou return at all in peace the Lord 
has not spoken by me if you return in peace that's the prophet that's the proclaimer that's a real preacher he was sure of his message he was sure of what the Lord had given him to tell the man and so even though the man looked at him as an enemy and reported him to another king and said you hear that I told you the man will not preach will not say any good thing about me and he doesn't only say it behind me even before me he raises up that trumpet and this trumpet annoys me now if you're a real preacher of the gospel you tell the story the way it should be told and then the king said hakim O people every one of you and let's look at acts chapter 24 and i'm reading from verse 24 acts chapter 24 reading from verse 24 after certain days when felix came with his wife drusilla which was a jewess he sent for paul and heard him concerning faith in christ now understand paul was imprisoned at this time and the man that could have authority to set him free was this man Felix, and he had the power. If he just said, Tell the waters there that man should not be in the prison, I release him, he'll be released. But he called for Paul to hear what the Lord had said the gospel, the gospel of salvation, the gospel that will matter after we leave this earth. And in verse 25, it says, and as he reasoned of righteousness talking to a king and temperance self-control self-discipline and ju the judgment to come felix trembled and answered go thy way for this time when i have a convenient season i will call for thee he never called again but the point is paul had done his duty do you do your duty when talking to people, when preaching the gospel? Do you talk of repentance? Do you talk of turning away from all their peculiar sins and believing on the Lord Jesus Christ so they can be saved? Or do you just uh, give a sugary message, a sweet message? that nobody can find anything inside the message they enjoy the message the drunkard enjoys the message the fornicator enjoys the message the thief and the national rogue enjoys the message and the deceiver the liar enjoys the message the backslider lo loves the message and they say i love to hear that man preaching he never hurts anybody he never brings anybody under conviction he's smooth is nice, is civilized, and is is a well socialized. Now that kind of preacher will not preach or pinch anybody, but the one that will declare the word of God as it is, that will make people to fall on their knees and say, Lord, what shall we do that we may be saved? Those are the people that lift up their voices like a trumpet. I pray God will give you a good trumpet voice, a good trumpet conviction, and a good trumpet standing. Have you seen those uh, trumpeters? When they stand, they stand like trumpeters. And when they, you know, put their hands, they put their hands on the right key. The right key that will produce the normal sound, the sound that will pierce the heart of the people and when the archangel will sound the trumpet on the final day they'll put their fingers on the right key that will raise that will wake up the dead and then we which are alive will be caught up together with them in the clouds therefore if you're expecting that that time of resurrection that time of rapture will be for you 
do your duty now and have the trumpet voice, the trumpet uh, vocation, and the trumpet vocab. We're coming to point number two. Point number two, the awakening trumpet that compels saved souls to be righteous. There are three things we're looking at here. Number one, number one, the faithful apostolic trumpet for our restoration. Number two, the fervent awakening trumpet for our righteousness. Number three, the forthright ascending trumpet for our readiness. Look at number one. Number one, the faithful apostolic trumpet for our restoration. It tells us in 1 Timothy chapter 1, reading from verse 12. 1 Timothy chapter 1 verse 12, I thank Christ Jesus our Lord who has enabled me for that he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry. You must understand, the Lord has looked at your life before the selection. The Lord has looked at your life, your intention, before the choice. The Lord has looked at you. You have the knowledge. You have the word. You have the gospel. You have the audience. You have the consecration. You have the strength, the inner strength. Now, all that remains when you get to the people is the willingness to say what ought to be said, to declare what you ought to declare without fear, without favor, without timidity, and without thinking about yourself. You are thinking about the one who has sent you, and he has sent you to the people. He wants them saved. But before they can be saved, they have to repent. They have to give up their evil ways. And if they don't know that evil is evil, if they don't know that sin is sinful, if they don't know that crime is a criminal act, and in their ignorance, they're doing what they're doing, somebody has to be bold enough, courageous enough, forthright enough, fervent enough to declare to them this is the way of salvation and so Paul the apostle said I thank my God because he has enabled me and he has counted me faithful and he has put me into the ministry it tells us in first Corinthians chapter 15 reading from verse 33 it says be not deceived, evil communications corrupt good manners. He was talking to those who are supposed to be Christians. They are supposed to have known the truth. He said, you are deceived. You are mixing with the wrong crowd. You are listening to the wrong voice. And you are going the wrong way. Be not deceived, evil communication corrupt good manners. Verse 34, it says, Awake to righteousness and sin not. Now you can see, he wasn't talking with, you know, from the two sides of the mouth. He wasn't giving anything doubtful. He says, you must awake. You are asleep. And Christ must not meet you in this condition. Everything is gray. You don't know which one is black and which one is white. Everything is like permissible. You don't know this is wrong and this is right. Everything appears to be acceptable. You don't know what is righteousness and what is unrighteousness. Awake to righteousness and sin not. For some have not the knowledge of God. I speak this to your shame. He wasn't looking that when he was saying that, was looking up, was looking at them. He was writing to them with real conviction. And he knew they had to awake, awake to righteousness. I pray that same boldness the Lord will give to us, will give to you. I will give to you 
so that everywhere you go when you are finished you will know by the grace of god i did what god expected me to do you will not fail you will not be a failure on the evangelistic field, in the house fellowship, on the bus, in the office, anywhere you go, you will declare the truth as it ought to be declared in Jesus' name. If you are not living right, if you are not living above reproach, if you are doing some secret, secret things, that those people in the office, in the market, in the community, that they know. And you know they know. You cannot come out boldly and speak forthrightly because they'll say, uh -uh, are you telling us that thing is wrong? But you did it the other day. And you enjoy that the other time. And you're living like that. Ah, uh, uh, how can you be talking like this? Uh, do you remember what you did? And you told me that I must not tell your church members. They must not know. And now you come out and you're talking like this. If you are defeated internally, privately, if you are sinning privately, you cannot come out and at the same time have that apostolic ring in your trumpet you have to live the, by the grace of god a righteous life an irreproachable life before you can come out and declare the truth like you ought to declare may the grace of god be abundant for righteousness in your life in jesus name we're coming to number two there. Number two there, the fervent awakening trumpet for our righteousness. The fervent awakening trumpet for our righteousness. In Acts chapter 18, Acts chapter 18, we're reading from verse 24, and a certain Jew named Apollos, born at Alexandria, an eloquent man an eloquent man now what makes a man eloquent he knows a subject that makes a man eloquent he has conviction on what he has to say he knows that this is the message that will save the sinner and that if the sinner does not hear this and walk on this and repent on the basis of this, he will be lost forever. He knows his calling. He says, I'm called to say and to do what no other man at this time will say or do. He knows I am the choice of God to declare this necessary, essential, indispensable truth unto this man at this time. That kind of conviction makes a man, a woman, eloquent. He knows I am saving him now. By the grace of God, through the help of Christ, through the atonement of Christ, from hell fire, that knowledge makes a man eloquent. Is certain Jew named Apollos, born at Alexandria, an eloquent man, mighty in the scriptures. He came to Ephesus. He knows where his verse is. He knows where the gospel is spelled out very clearly. He knows the way of salvation without any shadow of doubt in his mind. He is mighty in the scriptures. And then in verse 25, it says, This man was instructed in the way of the Lord, being fervent in the Spirit. Fervent in the Spirit. Fervent in the Spirit. It doesn't allow anybody to shut him down. Why are you shouting like that? I'm shouting because I wanted you to hear it very well. 
Why is it you are so uh, kind of urgent about this? Because I know you may not live uh, till tomorrow. And even if you live till tomorrow, you might not have the chance to consider the message and repent by tomorrow. Why are you running after me every time? And you are pointing at me every time? Because the Spirit of the Lord propels me. And he glues me to you that you are in danger. And I need to talk to you now. That's the man that has fervent spirit. And we're told of this Apollos. He was fervent in the spirit. And he spake and taught diligently. Diligently. With all his might. With all his strength. He, did, he wasn't saying... I don't know what I'll still need to do tomorrow, so I need to keep my cool and keep my voice and keep my stamina. I don't know what I'm going to ask of you tomorrow. I might need his help. I might need land from him. I might need some, you know, job from him. Therefore, I need to be careful what I say. No, he wasn't looking for any other thing. Everything he will get, he knows. He'll get it from the Lord. Therefore, he diligently declared the things of the Lord, knowing only the baptism of John. The Lord wants us to be fervent, and I pray we'll be fervent. You'll be fervent. The morning cry when the people are just waking up and you have uh, your megaphone with you, your voice is clear and it wakes up the people or as they're waking up, they're hearing the voice so very clearly showing them the way of salvation and the word of salvation in the night before you sleep in your area you have your megaphone and you're declaring who knows who will not live until tomorrow and you are so passionate about it because you are telling them this is the way of the lord the good old way walk ye in it in the bus you are not negligent in the taxi you are not negligent in your community you are not negligent you know the scriptures you know the word of salvation and you are fervent about it declaring to them the way of the lord let's look at number three here number three the forthright ascending trumpet for our readiness when you come to church and you're teaching you do your work as if you are the only one sent to that person to declare the word of god you'll not say well i'm just uh, you know feeling in time here the preacher was still calm I'm just feeling in time here. The real word will still come. Uh -uh. When you are there, you are the man of the moment. And you are to declare the word of God as a. What you are saying is the only thing they will listen to. That word will catch somebody will lead somebody to repentance, will lead somebody to stand firm, will lead the backslider to come to the Lord. You will not just say, I'm feeling in time. The real message will still come. Okay, if the real message is still coming, the one you are teaching and preaching, which one is that? That one is the unreal message. That one is an irrelevant message. That one is an unimportant message. That one is a message we can do without. I'm not sure you think like that. Therefore, when you are there, and when you are the man on stage, and nobody else is talking, you are preaching to the people as if this is the forthright ascending trumpet for the readiness of the people who knows the Lord may come just after you finish your message before another person will come to take over the forthright ascending trumpet for our readiness. In Matthew chapter 24, reading from verse 44, Therefore, be also ready, for in such an hour 
as she think not the son of man cometh have you noticed something about the words of jesus this is chapter 24 if you didn't read verses 12 and 13 and you read this you have got the message if you didn't read verse 42 of this chapter this verse would have given you enough if you didn't hear about chapter 24 and in verse 14 this would have given you something to think over to meditate on to prepare to meet the lord that's what and how you should minister the word coming from you if we didn't hear another person if we didn't hear what the other fellow will say after you the word must be so clear that the people will know look at this therefore because of the things that will be happening be ye also ready others were not ready at the time of noah at the time of Lord, you be ye also ready for in such an hour as she think not the son of man cometh i pray you'll be ready i will be ready i will be ready you'll be ready in jesus name if you are going to be ready you must wake up you must not live today like you lived yesterday forgetful careless negligent prayerless thinking that we'll still have another hundred years before he comes you must make up your mind that this is it every day i'm going to live as if the master my lord may come today luke chapter 21 and i'm reading from verse 34 luke 21 verse 34 and take it to yourselves lest at any time your hearts be overcharged with suffering and drunkenness and the cares of this life and the cares of this life and the cares of this life then it says so that day come upon you unawares verse 35 for as a snare shall it come on all them that dwell on the face of the whole earth verse 36 watch it therefore and pray always watch it therefore and pray always that ye may be accounted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. You will not miss it. We'll come to point number three. Point number three, the archangel's trumpet to catch up saints at the rapture. Three things we're looking at here. Number one, the trumpet sound at the rapture of heavenly minded saints number two the triumphant stage at the rapture of heavenward saints number three the tested service for the reward of heavenly saints number one number one the trumpet sound at the rapture of heaven minded saints. First Corinthians chapter 15, reading from verse 51. Behold, I show you a mystery. What's mystery? What the Old Testament prophets did not have clear understanding about. What's a mystery? What the Jewish people as a religious nation did not have insight into. 
What's a mystery? What most of the people at Corinth divided over, I am for this, I am for that. What those babes, carnal people, did not have clear evidence and focus on. And so Paul, the apostle, said, if you knew this, all those non-essentials will not bother you. And so he says, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. Verse 52, it says, in a moment, nobody will have a chance. I want to go and settle that job. I want to go and correct, rectify that. I want to go and make right that issue. No chance. In a moment, in a tweaking of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. In First Thessalonians chapter 4, reading from verse 14. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep die in Jesus will God bring with him. And then in verse 15, for this we say unto you, by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent, hinder, precede them which are asleep. In verse 16, for the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel with the trump of God, trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise. In verse 17, then we which are alive and remain alive in Christ, not dead in sin, alive in righteousness, not dead in wickedness, and righteousness alive in the Lord not dead with the world we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air and so shall we ever be with the Lord amen I'll be there you'll be there Saved, you'll be there. Sanctified, you'll be there. Steadfast, you'll be there. Working for the Lord, you'll be there. Not hiding anything, sweeping anything under the carpet, you'll be there. Clear conscience, no guilt, no condemnation, you'll be there. Amen. Amen. Hebrews chapter 11. I'm reading from verse 5, Hebrews 11, reading from verse 5, by faith Enoch was translated that he should not see death. And was not found because God had translated him. For before his translation, the rapture, he had this testimony that he pleased God. I pray you please God every time, all the days of your life. Verse 6, it says, but without faith, faith for salvation. Without faith, faith for holiness. Without faith, faith for sanctification. Without faith, faith for steadfastness. The just shall live by faith. But if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. Without faith, faith for standing firm 
for the truth without faith it's impossible to please him for he that cometh to god must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him i pray you'll be ready we're coming to number two here number two the triumphant stage at the rapture of heavenward saints the stage is the stage in which you have your stage of mind your stage of heart your stage and standing in the lord your spirituality before the lord comes triumphant stage you're not subdued you're not defeated you're not conquered you're not overcome you're not wobbling you're not doubting you're standing firm or wavering in the lord triumphant more than a conqueror at the time of the rapture first corinthians chapter 15 verse 57 but thanks be to god which giveth us the victory victory over sin which giveth us the victory victory over private secret sin which giveth us the victory victory over public common habitual sin thanks be to god which giveth us the victory through our lord jesus christ i pray he'll keep you victorious in first thessalonians chapter 3 reading from verse 13 first thessalonians chapter 3 verse 13 to the end for the purpose it may establish your hearts unblameable in holiness before god even your our father at the coming of our lord jesus christ with all his saints at the coming of the lord jesus christ he wants to meet us unblameable in holiness and we know he may come he may come now he may come in the night he may come anytime that's why we don't have any chance we don't have the luxury of dabbling into any defiling thing any shameful thing any reproachful life anything that will give us condemnation we want to be found when it comes unblameable in holiness before god at the coming of our lord jesus christ with the saints in first thessalonians chapter 5 verse 23 it says and the very god of peace sanctify you holy amen not partially i'm sanctified partially only that when somebody does something i don't really like i don't know that lion like attitude behavior comes out of me i don't even know when i get angry i just get angry i may be so angry i begin to throw this and throw this uh -uh. Oh, you're sanctified it sanctifies you entirely completely it sanctifies you wholly i don't know why they're always doing this against me they do this and they do that they make me angry nobody makes you angry you make yourself angry you forget holiness you forget the rapture you forget that the grace of god is sufficient for you nobody makes you angry 
<laughs> you know, I, I don't like this. What should I do? Give me depression. Nobody can give you depression. It's what you think about what he do. You're not thinking about your Lord. You're not thinking about the rapture. You're not thinking about the goodness of God. You're not thinking about the blessings the Lord has given you. That's why you have that stress or depression. Nobody gives you depression. You give it to yourself. But when you come to the Lord and you allow the Lord to sanctify you wholly, entirely. It says the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. And I pray God your whole spirit and soul and body may preserve blameless. I'm talking about you. Be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 24, it says, Faithful is he that calleth you, who also will do it. Everything God needs to do to get you ready for the rapture, he'll do it for you. We're coming to number three here. Number three, the tested service for the reward of heavenly says. It tests us. The work we do. He tests that. He examines that. First Corinthians chapter 3. I'm reading from verse 10. In First Corinthians chapter 3 verse 10. It says, according to the grace of God which is given unto me. Say unto me. Unto me. Unto me. He'll give you the fullness of grace. If God is not stingy with His grace. All the grace we need. He knows your condition. He knows your situation. He knows that place where you are. He knows the kind of irritation the people around you may cause. And your grace will be greater than your problem. Greater than your trial. Greater than your temptation. If somebody says, I'll make him trip, I'll make him fall, the grace of God coming into your life will be greater than their plan and their conspiracy. You will be victorious. What am I talking about there? Amen. I rejoice for you. Great grace will be upon your life. According to the grace of God, which is given to me, unto me, as a wise master builder. I have laid the foundation, and another builders thereon. But let every man take heed how he buildeth thereon. In verse 11, for other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. And then in verse 12, now, if any man builds upon the foundation gold, silver, precious stones, wood, his trouble. Verse 13, every man's work shall be made manifest for the day shall declare it because it shall be revealed by fire. And the fire shall test, try, examine every man's work of what sort it is. Verse 14. If any man's work abide which he has built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. Verse 15, if any man's work shall be burnt, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. What does that mean? A person has been walking and walking in his own personal life, is holy because without holiness no man no woman no worker no minister no preacher no pastor can see the lord is holy but in his working for the lord it's not effective to bring people out of sin to salvation but he's holy himself 
He is not effective and fervent and diligent to make people stand firm in righteousness. Himself he is holy because you have to follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. If you are rotting yourself, if you are unrighteous, if you are unholy, you cannot see the Lord. But you are holy personally, sanctified personally. That gets you ready for heaven. But the work you do, you do the work in such a way that nobody understands the work of salvation. The word of reconciliation, the word of repentance, the word of uh, redemption. They don't understand. And so all the work you do, religious work you do, everything is burnt in fire. Like a person who is living in a house and there is fire. He doesn't have any chance to carry any of his materials out. He escapes the burning house, but he carries nothing out. There are people that will get there because they have salvation and their personal relationship with God, but they get there empty-handed. All their works are burnt with fire. Think about it. We'll see have some little time to think. And so we must think, how many people have you brought to the Lord? How many people are staying and standing in the faith because of you? How many people have strong conviction in righteousness and holiness because of your ministry and because of your life? If everybody depended on your utterance, your ministry, your message, would anybody be standing? That's the test. But the people who are fervent, the people who are faithful, the people who are focused, and the people who search their face like a flint, and they declare the word as they ought to declare, and they bring conviction to people, and they bring conversion to people, and they bring consecration to people, and people are able to stand firm in the Lord. When the Lord comes, great will be their reward. I pray you will be among the number. I will be among the number. I will be among the number. I will be among the number. It will count you worthy. It will count you faithful. All the grace you need, all the strength you need to be faithful unto the end and to work and to work and to so work that will bring many unto righteousness from tonight, the Lord will give to you. You got it before, He will give you more. Where is he? Where is she there? Why don't you stand up? More. More grace, more strength, more fire more faithfulness, more goodness of God, more stamina, more courage, more fearlessness to declare the word and the will of God. Open your mouth and talk to the Lord. He'll give you grace so that you'll be ready for that time, the rapture, and you'll be ready for your reward and you'll bring many unto the Lord the courage, the stamina, the foundation to lift up your voice like a trumpet. Tell the Lord, give it to me, Lord, and the Lord will not fail you. Please pray and the Lord will answer.